Will you remain standing as we read God's Word together? From Luke 2, 1 through 16. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went from up, up from Gal Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Ju Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to him, to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there was shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto us, or unto you, a child is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel, a multitude of uh, heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. You can be seated. All right, well, good morning, good morning. It's good to see you guys. My name is Casey. I get to serve as one of the pastors here at the Avenue Church. A great joy of my life. Speaking of joys. Hey, what's really cool about that passage is a ton of things. We know the hero of the passage is Jesus. And he is, um, he's known, uh, like the sign is that there would be new life surrounded by a family. And I had a, a, a dear friend of mine, John O'Brien, this morning. He was like, hey, what do you think about this passage? And he was, he, uh, you know, was knowing, thank you, that I was going to preach on it. And he's like, um, it seems like, man, when, when people are baptized like they were yesterday, he's like, that, that picture of people um, being baptized in the ocean and then coming back out into new life and new family, it reminds me of this, like, first Christmas, new life surrounded by new family. And I thought it would be an awesome way just to start uh, today's message by asking those people who were baptized just yesterday, would you stand up so your new family could give you a warm welcome? Let me pray over you guys. Father, thank you for those that you are calling to life through the death and the resurrection of Christ. Lord, we love you and how you bring new life into all of these situations. And Father, I pray that you would protect them and that you would use them and that you would multiply that life to many through them. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Hey, and we, um, we also have a few other special guests here, um, and we are, we're delighted to uh, have uh, Delray Beach police officers here. Can we, would you guys mind standing just briefly so we can say thank you? We appreciate how you guys go around and visit different churches, and uh, we feel like uh, we're honored because you embody what we preach. Great sacrifice so that others may flourish. So thank you uh, for, for doing that on a daily basis. Hey, so, season to thrive. Season to thrive. Now, it's not always true for everybody. I mean, that's part of the reason why we're doing this series is because sometimes when we think about Advent and the holiday season, things like that, we, we don't necessarily think of that as being a time of thriving. For some of us, it's a time of remembering a lost one. For some of us, it's, um, it's, it's like um, an, uh, an exaggeration 
of some of the chaos that's going on inside of us. You know, like, have you ever been in that situation where you're supposed to be happy, but you're not? It's like the worst, right? It's, it's way better if it's just like a normal Thursday. But when it's like Christmas Eve and everyone's like lights or, or it's like Thanksgiving or whatever it is, and you, you've got stuff, it almost seems like the stuff gets heavier, if you know what I mean. And so when I think about thriving and in a season to thrive, I mean, part of the reason we're actually looking at a series uh, during Advent on thriving is because that is a, that's a stretch for a lot of us. It's a challenge. Um, and and I'm, I'm like one of them. I'm not thinking like that theoretically. I'm thinking that as somebody who walks with pretty, pretty consistent anxiety that bangs on my door um, and calls my name at like odd and weird ways. Uh, and, 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 and like I'm supposed, to be, I'm supposed to be one of the happy ones leading you into the joy of the season. And, and so, man, maybe it's just four weeks of like asking God, how is it that you want my heart to thrive? Uh, and hoping that you guys uh, are... are are blessed by that as well. And so that's, that's kind of like part of, those are, those are some different motivations uh, for the series is thinking like really, hey, this is not always the easiest time to thrive. Uh, and uh, what would it look like if we actually equipped ourselves to thrive? Because I think God wants us to. And so that's what we're doing. And, and we've been looking at different things like peace, and like hope. Today we're looking at joy. And, uh, and next week, uh, Pastor John Hicks is going to lead us as he teaches us on love on love. Hey, we all, I, I love how we're, we're starting um, every one of these messages with this quote from Melissa Kruger. Uh, you'll, see, you'll see kind of a portion of it. It starts off with talking about our kids and how they're excited about Christmas when they, you know, they can remember or, or anybody can remember Christmas past, but then they're also excited about Christmas future because they know that more is yet to come. And we'll pick up the quote here. As his people, we look back and remember that Christ has come and redeemed the world. We now look forward and hope for that day when he will come again, making all things new. More is yet to come. Say that with me. More is yet to come. I mean, that's, that's, our, that's our hope, right? That's our anchor. I mean, if, if our hope is just that we might thrive in different seasons in this world, we're, we're to like be pitied among all. I mean, if this is it, if this is really it, I, I, I think that... Uh, I think that that's case for, for being pitied. And you, you, as you read the scriptures, you, you're encouraged to actually broaden your horizons on what's to come. And I think if you get anything out of this Advent series, it would be that more is yet to come. That Jesus has fulfilled many of his promises, but some of his greatest promises are yet to come when he comes again. And so we hope and we, th we thrive and we, we look to him in part, knowing that it will be in completion in that day. There's, a, there's an interesting um, aspect of that passage that uh, Arno read, thank you Arno, um, uh, today, where, where the, the shepherds are the ones who um, get, get the news first, right? Well, I mean, it's actually the angels that come, and, and the angels know, and, and then they tell the shepherds, and um, the shepherds, just to give you a little context, were not necessarily a high-class citizen in that day. They were somewhat uh, outcast. They were not always known as handling things with great integrity. Um, so being a shepherd wasn't like, oh, that's, that's maybe the first class of people you would want to invite to, um, like, God breaking into humanity. You could have thought of rabbis. You could have thought of a ton of other people in first century um, Judaism, especially if this was going to break into God's chosen Jewish people. And, and and yet, God chooses shepherds. I think there's a statement there, but um, I want to look at what they did more than their character in this particular message. And what they did, according to the, script the scriptures, was they went with haste. There was haste about what they did. There was like an urgency to them. They were promised, watch this, they were promised joy, and they were like, I don't care what I've got here, I got to find that. I gotta, if you're promising me this good news of great joy, I'm willing to leave where I am to find it. I'm going to make haste to get after that joy. And as a matter of fact, I think it is radically biblical, gospel-centered, and very pleasing to the Lord that you pursue joy, that you pursue happiness. 
that we not make this big delineation between, well, there's joy and there's happiness and, like, and we, we kind of like, we, we cut hairs over, well, what? No, 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 no. You, if you do like a, a, a word study throughout the scripture, you will find joy and happiness and blessed. There is a lot of interchanging here. And, and so when, when I tell you and when you see the shepherds being um, urgent about their joy or about their happiness, it should do two things. It should motivate you to do the same thing and it should resonate with you at a soul level because you know that you were like created to pursue it. Because as soon as you lose it, you do everything you can to get it back. Our world is on a mission to be happy, is it not? Yes, sir. I mean, we've got a lot of other things we're, we're pursuing, but they're all kind of in the name of being happy or being joyful or, or meeting a longing. And you know when, you, when you're unhappy, when you're in a season where your joy has been taken away, it upends your world, does it not? And you're doing almost everything you can to get it back. I think that's biblical. I think that's actually how God created us. I've been um, reading a book, and I'm going to reference it a little bit more here later in the message, but it's by John Mark Comer, um, and there's a lot of influence on, on what you'll hear today uh, from this, and it's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Doesn't that sound awesome? I should read it even slower. I think I'm doing it discredit. <laughs> I don't know how I'm, this is going to affect my preaching, but I'll, I'll try to read it slower. The Ruthless elimination of hurry. Wouldn't it be cool if the rest of just like your Sunday was lived at that pace? Now can you imagine like if you began to have a lifestyle where, where like the goal was the elimination of hurry and, and one of the premises, the main premise of the book is that um, he actually quotes a guy by the name of John Ortberg that you can't live in the kingdom of God in a hurry. They're actually incompatible. He looks at Jesus and he says Jesus was certainly busy and full of activities. He just didn't have a sense of hurry about him. And as I think about this pursuit of joy and this idea of well, it's okay, um, even more than okay, that we pursue our joy. John in the book, and, and, and you'll, you'll see it uh, throughout the scriptures, is you'll realize that although you may be pursuing joy, joy is always the result of something greater. Happiness, being blessed. It's always the result of something greater. So our hearts are inclined to pursue joy, but follow me, joy is always going to be the result of something that's larger than, than the actual joy. And, and in the scriptures, it's very clear that joy is the result of pursuing Jesus. It is not the Holy Spirit, but it is a fruit or part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It comes as a result of us pursuing the person of Jesus. There's joy attached to that. And so although our, our, the initial longing of our hearts might be joy, happiness, living a blessed life, we get that by pursuing someone greater who loves to give it. Amen. He makes a great case in the point about um, the, the Jesus that lives in your mind. He has him do this exercise in his, in his latest message where he, close your eyes, imagine Jesus and who do you imagine? And then he says, what does his face look like? How many of, how many of you had a, had a smiling f Jesus? We're, we're, we're sometimes... We're sometimes, I think, misinformed about the character and the nature and the joy of Jesus, the happiness of Jesus. We actually did a whole series here at this church about, about happiness and how, how God is the most happy, joyful, blessed being person you will ever know. And so joy and happiness, it's a, it's, it's a very godly thing. It doesn't compromise holiness. It actually goes along with holiness. And so as we think about joy and, and moving with great haste towards joy, let's take a look at this passage here. Um, I, I, think, I think a good question, we're going to do some inventory. Uh, we'll look at some insight here. And, uh, but I think a good question uh, to kind of keep in the back of your mind is how committed are you to your own joy? 
Although our hearts may long for it, I think at times, if I look at my own life, I find myself sometimes more committed to, like, entertainment or to comfort. I love any comfort monsters. I love comfort. I love comfort. It's, it's okay. Like, comfort's not a horrible thing, right? It's just not the main thing. So Sunday afternoon rolls around, and some, my kids, at some point, the, the little guys head into bed, and it is like comfort time for daddy. <laughs> it's like, no more wiffle ball, no more Daniel. It's some football game probably I don't care about, or some cheesy Christmas movie, my wife. And I'm not going to lie, I kind of like them a little bit. Okay, and, and, we're, and there's going to be comfort food, and there's going to be comfort candles, probably not three, but a triwick for sure. And, um, we, you know, we're going to like, we're going to just get, it's going to get comfortable. Or some of us are, con are committed to our convenience, right? It's like you got to have like the latest thing that will make your life more convenient. And so even though your hearts are telling you to go after joy, a lot of times we settle for things less than joy, like comfort, convenience, entertainment, stuff like that. So, so the question I just want you to be pondering as we look at this is like, how committed, to you are your, how committed are you to your joy? And I, I know you're not as committed to your joy as God is. You have a father who is radically committed to your joy know that before we begin. Christmas inventory. Um, so, so you heard the passage. Thank you, Arno, for reading it. Uh, inventory is always good because we want to we take an assessment of what, what is actually here. That's what you do in inventory, right? You count the things that are actually here. So in Luke 2, um, to be true to the passage, we've got a couple of things here. Um, we've got uh, Caesar Augustus. Okay? It's important to know who Caesar Augustus is. He's a guy who had come into power in a time when, when power was needed. So you might think of Rome as always being this like amazing, powerful, well put together machine. But at, at, at one point, Rome was kind of like a church plant. Okay? If you've ever been to like a, a grown up church that's not nine years old, we're nine, just so you know. Like a, you know, like a, like a 30, 40, 50 year old church, they got stuff on point, right? Like, they, everything works usually, and if it doesn't, it's like quick, quickly fixed. There's like two or three people that run out and fix it. Well, th that's not necessarily like a church plant that's nine years old, it, but that doesn't always happen. Stuff gets unfixed and stays unfixed for like the whole service. <laughs> and then you got to like put stuff away. You know, like, like these chairs, they don't live here. We set them up, and then another church comes in and uses them. But, but my point is like, Nine-year-old church, we don't look like we did when we were nine months old, but we also don't look like, you know, some of the grown-up churches. We, we just kind of figure it out. I don't know what you think about Rome, but Rome wasn't always grown-up Rome. And there was a time when Rome was in chaos and civil war and stuff like that. This guy, Caesar Augustus, comes in. He had, that wasn't his actual original name. He gives himself that title. Augustus means exalted one. He comes in and he settles things. He, he brings in the Rome that you might have in your mind. The like powerful Rome that, that got thing on, that got everything, everything's like on point. And um, it was actually kind of needed because they were in chaos. And so what's interesting is uh, the world around Rome, it had started, but the world around Rome in, in some ways was maybe like looking for an Augustus or an exalted one or like if I could use a biblical word, a savior. And, and so Caesar Augustus he kind of provided that for them. So that's the, that's the context of the world that Jesus is, is brought into as we're taking inventory and, and we see that there's a registration and so what that means, like a census, people are going back and it wasn't just um, to, to count for counting's sake, it was to increase the efficiency of taxation. So if anybody who works for the IRS, this is your verse right here, okay? That's your memory verse. For the I don't know what to do with the rest of that. This is what I learned. It was all about taxation. And then you get this thing called Bethlehem. Now, now with Bethlehem, um, that's not just a city. We, we've spent a couple weeks um, in Isaiah um, 7 and Isaiah 9. But Bethlehem comes from Micah 5 too. Uh, so if you want to write that down, just try, take a look at that later um, this week. Uh, but Bethlehem was the predicted place where the Messiah would be born. But the problem is that Mary and Joseph and all their drama that we looked at last week, remember their drama? Where it's like, what? Pregnant? Who's the guy? What's, what's happening here? And then dreams, craziness, right? All that's happening not in Bethlehem. It's like, it's, like Naz it's, like, it's like 80 miles away. And so how do you get the expected Messiah to the place where he needs to be born? I mean, you could, I guess, maybe sent another dream to Joseph. Like, not only are you going to take your wife, but you guys are going on a road trip. 80 miles. Grab the 
minivan donkey. Like, you're out. It's going to take you a while. No, no, no. He actually, it's interesting. God uses someone like Caesar Augustus, who, as far as we know, never has a converted heart, never has a born-again experience, never has interaction of falling in love with Jesus. He uses someone who's, who's what you might think is not part of his re redemptive plan to actually accomplish his redemptive plan, which to me is really good news because it means that God is using all things, good, bad, ugly, evil, awesome, not awesome, broken, unbroken, being fixed. He's using all things to drive his redemptive purposes. I don't know what's in your life that's got you in Nazareth and when you think you should be in Bethlehem. I don't know what it is. But do not dismiss the God of the unseen and unexpected. Especially if we're going to talk about joy. So you got Mary with her child. You've got a reference back there to Isaiah 7 and even Isaiah 9 where we're told that there's going to be this virgin who's going to be pregnant and this, this kid's going to be pretty amazing. Um, we've, got the, we've got the manger scene there. You've got God breaking into the chaos in a very humble and unexpected way. And so just kind of in my notes as I was thinking through this particular section of taking inventory, it's like we have a great unexpected journey that was based on great expectations. Like, God's not surprised. God is moving the pieces, although those people who are involved in it are probably quite surprised. Like, Mary's got to be asking, God, like, I'm carrying your son. Why now? Why, I mean, could this census, you're the God of the census, could this census not have waited like three years till Jesus could have at least walked? Or we could, you know, 12 would have been better, could have had his own donkey, you know, like, like, what? <laughs> like, why? What? I mean, it's the unexpected journey, but it's based on great expectations. I mean, I just want to give you a little, a little hope and, and, and hopefully a little joy in the sense that, that God is not surprised at your details. God is not wringing his hands about, well, well what am I going to do about this situation now? Look where he is. He went back to his sin. He's in that situation, lost her job, season of depression, still no child. Like, like God's, God's not confused about that. He's not frustrated. I mean, he hates evil and, and sin, but, but he's working all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I heard a definition of joy being an attitude that Christians adopt based on the love of God. I'll add the audacious, radical, relentless love of God. It's an attitude you adopt not based on your circumstances, but based on the God of your circumstances and his unchanging character. If you if you uh, allow your attitude to match your circumstances, well, you're going to be like all over the map. And joy will be something that you taste every now and then when life and circumstances are good, when you've like actually made it to Bethlehem, but you're never going to thrive on the way to Bethlehem. And there are people around you who are like needing you to thrive on the way to Bethlehem so that they know that God is not just the God of the destination. He's the God, the good God of the journey as well. So inventory, what do we have here basically? We've got one way maker. We've got one way maker. Anybody familiar with the song Waymaker? Yeah. Okay, it's my favorite song. I, you know, I, I love it. It comes up. There's a line in Waymaker that says, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. So our inventory in this particular case is we've got one way-making God even when we don't understand or realize it. Now, here's why I want to reference the book again because he does a, he does a word study on a very familiar churchy term. 
When I say churchy term, that doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. It just means it's pretty familiar. And sometimes familiar terms, they lose their punch. But I'm going to use the churchy term, and I'm going to then explain it, kind of how he unpacks it. And here's the churchy term. You ready? Re um, repent and believe. You guys familiar with that? Repent and believe? It's how Jesus says, how does, how does someone enter the kingdom of God? They repent and they believe. But I, but I love the word study that he does here. And he looks at repent, and then he looks at, at believe. And um, the, the word repent in the Greek like, like one, one, if not the main meaning of the word repent is to like change your mind. To change your mind about something. And, and, to ch and when, once your mind changes, it's like a change of lifestyle. It's like we talk about it like I was living this way with myself at the center and surrounded by my sin. And now I'm repenting. I'm leaving that. So much so that I even, I even have godly sorrow that I used to live like that. But I, I'm changing my mind about where I can find life. And the word believe... He talks about it as, um, of, of this idea of, uh, unfortunately, what we've done with the word believe sometimes is, is like, um, it's an assent to some theological concepts. That's what we've done with the word believe. We've said, as long as you can get your mind around certain theological concepts, that means you believe. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually part of believing. It's just not the fullness of believing. Believing is trusting. There's a difference between me understanding that I'm forgiven of all of my sins and made pure because of the blood of Jesus Christ and actually living free. I can, I can be forgiven and bound up because I believe what Christ has done for me. I just don't fully trust that it's enough. And so I keep adding to it. I believe that this ground will catch me and I can preach about it and I can give you the exegetical and all the blueprints that that floor is going to catch all 100 and change in me. <laughs> and then I can live my life like this. <laughs> that floor is amazing. But I can't get near you because I'm not really sure it's going to hold me. And I live my whole life kind of like back and forth, back and forth. And I never experience what life would be like if I just trusted and put myself in a situation where I couldn't go back. I mean, that's what trust is, right? When you sat down in that chair, there was no saving the embarrassment that you would have endured had that chair failed you. You gave it up for the chair and you don't even know who made that chair. We're talking about a God who said, I want to take my son and crush him on your behalf. And then I'm going to give you an empty grave. And then I'm going to show him off to hundreds and hundreds of people. And then I'm going to let people throughout the ages, millions and millions and millions of people, believe and get baptized and stand up in churches so that you know the death and resurrection of Christ is enough. You can trust and rest in that. Yes. Way more than the chairs you guys are sitting in today. Amen? Amen? So if we can take those words and maybe, maybe put them in a category of rethink and trust. What if we just stayed there for today? What if we thought about repentance as rethinking and we thought about believing as trusting? Rethink and trust. As I've mentioned, this, is, um, this has been a great, a great read for me. I'm halfway through. He does a great job with this. And it influenced how I thought about each of these points. If we have one way maker here, then I believe if I want to experience the fullness of joy, if I want to thrive in joy, although my life and my family and my situation is far from perfect and there's some broken edges that still keep poking me and making me bleed, I need to rethink and trust that my wig maker is good enough right now. Number two, Christmas insight, right? Let's get some, let's get some insight from this passage. So, so who is actually here? We look at this in Luke 2, verses 8 through 11, and we see that there's good news of great joy. Good news of great joy. And so we come back to this idea of joy, a state of well-being, happy happiness, an attitude. 
good news of great joy for all the people. We see that the, the shepherd, the shepherds, they get to be the first to come. The outcasts, the ungodly, those who are in a field get to be the first to see God break into humanity. And when, what do they realize they're in the midst of? They're in the midst of a savior. The savior. The savior. Interesting that the context that Jesus comes in, in into is you've got Caesar Augustus who changes his name so that everyone knows he is the exalted one and he does bring some saving. And then you've got Jesus in a, in a manger who takes on like a common name and a common birth and is just kind of humbly ushering in the kingdom of God. I think that that's when you know the kingdom of God is being ushered into a situation. When it comes in like quietly and humbly. Not as loud as the world would have it. It's probably one of the cues that the kingdom of God is upon us. It's probably true in our individual lives as well. And so in this particular case, the insight is, is we've got this great unexpected joy based on great expectations again. I mean, so God told us that this is what the joy is going to be. That uh, he's going to give us a savior Isaiah 7, it's going to be God with us, Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, and then he talks about like, like some of the characteristics of this Savior. How the government will be upon his shoulders. He's going to be the Prince of Peace. He's going to, end, he's going to bring peace, but it's going to come through war. Okay, and so we, we have in our midst, as we look about who is really here, we've got this very special baby person, son, predicted. It's unexpected because, because most of the time we think of dignitaries and coming in like Augustus, like taking a new title. When you get a new job, when you enter into a new office, you get a new title, new bat, whatever the case might be. Like now you look at me as fill in the blank. And so it's like unexpected the way God brings in his greatness. The way God saves the world is unexpected and a ton of people miss it. A ton of people are blind to it because they're so conditioned to God saving the world the, way, the same way the world saves the world. Let's just get bigger and stronger. And God's like, no, I'm going to save the world by losing. I'm going to let all of you win. I'm going to make it to the back of the line. I'm going to take your sin. I'm going to put it upon my son and crush him so that I can forgive you. It's going to look like great loss. And then you're going to look to find my son. You're not going to be able to find him because he's going to be at my right hand as through loss, he overcomes your sin and your death and offers you the same opportunity. It's going to be unexpected joy, but based on these great expectations of God himself. And so, what's the insight here? I think the insight here is not only that it's unexpected, but this idea of that, that we probably need a Savior more than we realize. I don't know what you think of um, right now, as, as what will bring you joy or, or, or happiness. But, and maybe it's, maybe it's a savior. Maybe you, maybe you are like really aware of the fact that, that you need someone to save you from you. <laughs> Some of you might be in a situation where you need someone to save you from someone else. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's an addiction. Whatever. I don't know. But, but some of you might have an awareness, like, I'm powerless, I can't do it, like, I need a Savior. But I think sometimes we live at a level, of, uh, I'll say above that, but it's not really better than that. And, and we think that, well, we just need a better job, or we just need a better husband, or we just need more money, or we just need more time, or I just need my child to not, like, disobey me quite as often and as good as he or she can. Like, I just need respect. I just... I feel like there's a lot of substitutes that we go after. Um, but the insight here is that I think, I think we need a savior more than we realize. I'm talking about someone who can come in and rescue and renew you because believe it or not, no matter how awesome you've been or think you are or you've got your amazing improvement plan, you can't do it. The most loving thing I can tell you is you cannot do it. And the reason I have to yell that is because I don't believe that. When you grow up in church and you get saved at a young age and you follow the rules and you pursue purity and you do a lot of things according to the Spirit and, the, and God's at work at you, that's a really amazing and awesome thing. But there's a subtle lie that walks right alongside that that says, you know what, you really are a good boy, Casey. 
So you better maintain that. Because that's really what got you here. And it's a lie from Satan and it belongs in the pit of hell. We need a savior more than we thought. And that's probably the beginning of joy for us. So maybe today we, we decide that we'll rethink and trust. So then finally we look at a Christmas invite. You guys were encouraged on, on the invites. We'll look at a Christmas invite in, in verses 12 through 16. And, and we see that the, the shepherds were invited. It's this great unexpected invitation, as we talked about. That's not probably the people you're going to invite. Um, but it's based on great expectations. Because God knew he would save people like me. He knew it. So he's like, I'll tell the shepherds first. So that Casey can actually think he can come too. That's what I'll do. I'm not going to start with the, I'm going to start here. Because you know, you know, and the scriptures are clear that this was going to be through the Jewish people, but it was going to be for who? Everyone. Everyone. So let's start in the margins so that there's no mistake who this God is for. It is not the well that need a physician, but the who? Sick. Sick. The sick. And here is what the well did with Jesus' invitation. No thanks. I'm angry. You're compromising me. I'm going to put you on a cross and deal with you like that. Here's what the sick did. They made haste. You want to know if you understand your sickness? You want to know how you can, you want to know if, if you've got a good grasp on your sickness? With how much haste do you move towards Jesus? Because the amount of haste and the degree that you understand that you need a savior is it, it, just, I'm guessing, go hand in hand. Because when I probably don't move with haste is when I've probably forgotten my condition. And so the Christmas invite is what? Make haste. Make haste. Get radically serious about your joy Amen. and quit living in your mediocre existence of Christianity where Jesus and his scripture and his people are take or leave we're not called to have like 10 out of 10 days every day it's not Christmas Eve every day although I would love that But I don't think we're called to drag around and have our theology tell us that we're to be a people of joy, but our face and countenance in life say that we're a people of like, eh. I mean, the world can pull that off. They actually pull that off better than we do. We are called to thrive in joy. It's your birthright. It's why Christ went to a cross and suffered so that you can thrive in joy. Not ease, not without brokenness, not without pain, but that in the midst of those things, you would have a pervasive, a dangerous, a courageous joy that says, I am not my circumstances. Because what is in me is greater than what is in my world. Make haste. Maybe... We need to change our minds and trust that the, that the greatest thing we can do this Advent season is reprioritize joy. Well, what would that look like, thriving? What would it look like to thrive in this type of joy? Life. Yes. Amen. A life that overflows. A life that cannot be contained. Check this out. This is what Paul writes to the church in Rome. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may, what's that word? Abound, thank you, in hope. You've got joy, you've got peace, you got hope. It's almost like Paul was getting ready for an Advent series. I don't know. Like, got all the themes there. 
You might even talk about love pretty soon. It seems as though those things make like the perfect storm. They make the, you, ever, you guys ever see the movie The Perfect Storm? Maki Mock! <laughs> Nobody? Okay, sorry. <laughs> if you're not like from Boston or you didn't see that movie and you missed that, but. Um, I was thinking like, if I'm gonna talk in that Boston accent, what words, I, I know ka and um, okay, I'm just gonna keep going. But listen, <laughs> but Perfect Storm, you got three things that go into the perfect storm. I don't even remember what they were. But they're like, okay, you've got a, like a nor'east, uh, you got like a nor'easter, I'm making stuff up right now. You've got, um, you've got a hurricane this, and you've got western swells. <laughs> so those of you who saw the movie, you're like, this dude is such a heretic. I, I, but there were three things that made up the perfect storm. And when that perfect storm hit, it was destructive. Unrelent. Unrelenting. I think hope and peace and joy, those are the three elements that I know make up the perfect storm of love. Nice. Because it is not to the end of joy just that we be happy people. Again, I reference this because if you get the book, you'll read it and be like, man, Casey, that was a really insightful point. I just read it and I was like, wow, that's really good, John Mark. It's not just joy for joy's sake. It's joy and it's hope and it's peace so that we're free to be a people of love. The perfect storm comes in and then it starts like addressing and destroying some of the plague that like our single moms face. And, and you get a place like City House that crops up. You know, City House is the result of the perfect storm where you had peace and you had hope and you had joy. You had the fullness of God's spirit just kind of working in a couple of people who thought, hey, I think we can make an impact by providing like two years of safe, safe gospel-centered housing and love to these moms so that we can destroy some of the generational curses that they are living in. The perfect storm of peace and hope and joy when it hits your life will start destroying the evils around you. This is not so we can be like, I'm just a happy camper Christian. That's weird and annoying. <laughs> Nobody wants that. For a long period of time, they won't tell you, but they don't want that. But what they do want is, you know what, man? What do you need? Yeah, I, I, I know my life probably maybe can't afford it right now, but man, I, I got so much peace. I got so much hope. I got so much love. I'm a person of sacrifice, man. I bleed because my Savior bled. He lives in me. And I'll, I'll give you. What, well, you want the city house? What do you want? What do you want to do? You want to help, you want to help the homeless? You want, you, want to, uh, you want to start new churches? You want, to, you want to go over here? What about Haiti? What about this? What about the Hamas? Like, it starts destroying and having an effect that can't be stopped. So here's where we finish, just real practical. In this passage of, of Romans, it says, in believing. In believing. So here's the deal, you can't really thrive in joy if you don't believe. And we looked at believing today as trust, if you don't trust. We've got these four R's that we've talked about every week, remembering, reading, rehearsing, and resting. And we've come back to rehearsing, rehearsing the gospel, rehearsing the truths. Why is rehearsing so important? It's so important because we forget, and if we forget, we'll be tempted not to believe. And if we're tempted not to trust and not to believe, we are not going to be any kind of perfect storm. We're going to be the passing shower that you can't even hardly feel. Dallas Willard writes, it's the ruthless elimination of hurry. Like, like that's, that's what we get, we got to get our minds around. Why? Because when we're in a hurry and we're living lives that are in a hurry, there's no way we are going to create the space and time to get with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to have a context where we can actually trust him to be enough. He might 
be our savior, but he will not necessarily be our treasure that we can trust and start moving forward from. Let me suggest something to you, then I'm out. It's not just slowing down. I gotta give you something to, to think about. What if this week you were to, every day, commit to the ruthless elimination of hurry, and you were to say, you know what, um, I'm gonna go after an hour a day of just getting with Jesus. An hour a day. Not all together. Not like, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to read for an hour, I'm going to pray for an hour. I'm gonna... No, no, no. Like, what if you were just like, again, he references in the book, he said, that like, all the spiritual greats, they would tell you that it's about an hour a day of abiding with Christ that leads to these kind of things. What if you got super creative and you're like, I'm going to get 60 minutes of my day. It might be 10 here, it might be 5 here, it might be 20 here, it might be reading, it might be singing, it might be listening to a podcast. I don't know, but what if I was like, man, I'm going to get after my joy because I'm tired of living without the joy that Jesus has promised. And what if that started even right now as we sing? I'm going to invite our prayer partners to come and we're going to sing about the adoration of this Jesus made this moment be the moment that you commit to prioritizing your joy, getting after the person of Jesus and expecting more from the life that he's come to give. Amen? Let's sing. He's got something for you in that hour. You've got the hour. You've got it. And he's got something for you. He's got himself and attached to himself is this joy. If you want to receive a benediction, you can put your hands out like that. It's a promise from God, of God. Now may the God of joy, peace, and hope, may he make his face to shine upon you, and may he fill you with his spirit, and as a result, may you be radically joy-filled ambassadors of your King. Amen and amen. Love you guys.